Welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. I'm glad you're joining us and welcome back if you're returning. So we've been going through our EKG coding reference guide that's now made available. So if you don't have access, you can get access by putting this link into your search bar, enter your email address, uh, click submit. And from there, we'll send you an email just to confirm uh, your email address. You'll click on a link there and then you'll have access. Okay, and you only have to do that the first time. Now, we've gone through part one where we looked at the general features in the P-wave abnormalities, atrial enlargement, different types of rhythms, the sinus, atrial, junctional, uh, and ventricular rhythms in part two. In part three, looked at different conduction blocks, okay? Part three, voltage criteria, hypertrophy, and axis. So if you wanna go back and look at any of those, how to determine axis, what is the criteria for right or left ventricular hypertrophy? You can do so. Now we're in part five, okay? And we've looked at interventricular conduction delays uh, such as right bundle branch block. And in this uh, lecture, we're gonna look at something called left bundle branch block, okay? And the complete form of it, which it almost always is. So we're gonna look at complete left bundle branch block in this lecture. All right, and just to remind you, we have our course material that's separate from all our online stuff that's uh, made available, but this is stuff we used to teach our students, and here's the EKG course. You can go to www.ekg.md and then click on this, and you'll be able to look at some of the sample books, some of the uh, lectures, the corresponding videos that are separate from the ones that we make available uh, publicly. So take a look there if you're interested. And let's get started. So left bundle branch block, what is actually going on here? I really believe it's important to understand what is going on because if you do so, you're able to understand why you see what you see on the EKG. So in the left bundle branch, let's just review the conduction system. So you have the sinus node up here, okay, and that's this one here. And then you have the AV node, which is this here. You have the his bundle this portion here, and then it splits off into the right bundle branch to the right side. This is the right ventricle. This is the right bundle branch that it's uh, pointing to here. This is the left ventricle and the left bundle branch. You have a left anterior and a left posterior fascicle that come off that left bundle branch as well, okay? So in this lecture, we will focus on what happens when we have a block in on the left side of the heart, okay, the left bundle branch uh, blocked, okay. So, and where that could be, it could be either here high, or it could affect both fascicles, okay. Either way, you have the whole left side of the heart, the whole left bundle branch, uh, blocked early on, and so conduction does not flow through uh, down to that area. Now, eventually it will, and we'll show how that happens. So left bundle branch block is essentially an anatomical or functional dysfunction in the left bundle branch or in the left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle. So it's either the left bundle branch is taken out or the left anterior fascicle plus the left posterior fascicle, okay? Both of them can cause a left bundle branch block. And this block causes the impulse to travel down the unobstructed right bundle branch because this right side is unobstructed, okay? And then, as a result, it has to then depolarize the left side in a right-to-left fashion. This results in a wide QRS, a broad S wave in V1 and V2, and a broad R wave in the lateral leads, V5, V6, 1, and AVL. So let's just take a look at that a little closer. Okay, so you have conduction that is going down the from the top, whether it's from coming from the junction or from somewhere above. Let's say it's coming from the sinus node. It's coming down the sinus node to the AV node and then gets about here. Okay, and then it's approaching the bundle branches, but as it gets to the left side, it gets blocked. Okay, although going down the right side is just fine and the right ventricle depolarizes. And as a result, the left or the right ventricle depolarizes first, and this is the first vector we see, okay, going this way. And then we have to then depolarize the left side because the left bundle branch wasn't able to uh, send the impulses down. And as a result, you have this slow cell-to-cell -cell depolarization that now depolarizes the left ventricle from right to left, okay? And that is the second main vector that we see. 
So let's just draw this again. Imagine that we have our heart here. Okay, and this is our box diagram. This is our right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. Okay, up here this is your right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. Okay, so our box diagram, our conduction from the sinus node, imagine it coming down here to the AV node. It comes down to the right side. The right bundle branch is just fine, okay, and that produces that first vector. So that's vector number one. And then we have the left bundle branch and the left anterior and posterior fascicles, although there's a block either here or at both, okay? And as a result, the impulse cannot get through. So after the right ventricle is depolarized, then you have this vector that goes now the other way to depolarize the left ventricle, and that's vector number two. That's that slow cell-to-cell -cell depolarization, and that's where you get that widening of that QRS complex, okay? So <clears throat> let's look at, look at where the leads are placed. We know that the right ventricle is the most anterior portion, so leads V1 and V2 sit, tend to sit there. And then over here on the left side, we have V5, V6. We also have uh, lead 1 and AVL. Okay. Now, this is not anatomically correct, so I don't want you to get confused there, but uh, it's just fine for our uh, demonstration purposes. Okay. And as you would expect, because the impulse number 1 okay, is going towards uh, V1 and V2, in V1 and V2, you may see an initial R wave, okay? However, because it's going away from V5 and V6 and the other lateral leads, you may see initial uh, negative deflection, okay? So that's one thing to know. Let's just move this down here a little bit. So we'll draw it like that, okay? So initial negative deflection. And then you have that main vector, this one, number two, going towards the left lateral leads, okay? And remember, that's the slow vector, that slow cell, to de cell depolarization. And as a result, in, it's leaving or going away from V1 and V2, so you'll see a wider complex going away, okay? And then after that, you may see the rest of your ST segment and T wave. So hopefully that makes sense. And then in the left lateral leads, because it's going towards those, uh, you may see what we see here as a wide R wave, okay? Or sometimes you see notching over here, okay? And then again, you have your, let's just erase this here, your ST segment and T wave, okay? So notice that what's going on. I've highlighted in red that second slow to cell to cell depolarization wave, okay? So the main thing we mentioned is wide QRS because of the slow cell to cell depolarization. So wide QRS greater than or equal to 120 milliseconds in V1 to V2, okay? We may see in these leads uh, a broad S wave. So broad S wave and V5, V6, and then also one in AVL, you may also see it as in these leads, you have a broad or notched R wave, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And that broad or the widening of the QRS complex is coming from that slow cell to cell depolarization, the delay in the ventricular depolarization from that vector two, okay? So remember, looking at the terminal portion of the QRS complex is the key. That's where you tend to see the things, all right? So the criteria is the wide QRS. Remember, there can be complete and incomplete in these cases. Here, we're talking about complete. And when we talk about complete, that means that the QRS interval is at least 120 milliseconds, okay? If it's less than 120 milliseconds, what you rarely see in a left bundle branch block, uh, but it's possible. In that case, uh, it would be less than 120 milliseconds, but have these uh, morphology changes that we just described. So V1 and V2, what we see are these deep and broad S waves. So these here, notice them. Okay. And then what we see um, in V5 and V6, and sometimes 1 and AVL, are these broad monomorphic R waves. So it's sometimes these notching up here. So notice that here. They're positive. And hopefully it makes sense why that's the case. Here's AVL. Okay. 
obviously more prominent in the precordial leads there, but hopefully that makes sense why you see it. Now, another thing I just want to mention is we talked about the uh, ST segment, okay? So notice that if you have your baseline here, let's just say we draw our baseline, that the ST segment is elevated here, okay? And it's depressed here. And then you have this upright T wave and then this inverted T wave, okay? And what do we call that? Well, we call this a discordance when the main QRS vector is going in the opposite director, direction of the ST T wave segment. So notice this is mostly going down, okay? And then this is up. This is up and then this is down. And if you look at the EKG here that we gave the example of, let's just erase this. So notice that this is mostly down and then if you look closely, there's some ST elevation as well as some, an upright T wave there. And we call this discordance. Even V2, you can see it much more clear, okay, and then up. And then if you look at V5 and V6, notice this is now positive and then negative, okay, look at it there. And the same thing in these leads here, okay. So we call that discordance, and that is normal in the setting of a bundle branch block, okay. The same thing in a right bundle branch block. Now, what would be abnormal is if you looked at V5 and V6, and maybe you saw a complex that looked something like, uh, let's just, here, we'll try to, like that, okay? And the main point I'm showing you is it has that morphology in V5 and V6 that you may expect, okay? But notice here. The ST segment is now elevated, and now you have an upright T wave. And this is what we call concordance when the QRS complex, the main vector, is going in the same direction as the T wave. That's concordant complexes. In the setting of a bundle branch block like this, uh, that can be a sign of ischemia. Okay, And there's something called the Scarbosa criteria that then capitalizes on some of that as well. Uh, so some causes of left bundle branch block, okay, include idiopathic left bundle branch fibrosis, degeneration, degeneration, aortic stenosis can lead to a hypertension, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, left ventricular hypertrophy. As we stretch that uh, left bundle branch, decrease its supply, uh, you can get this as well. Valvular disease, cardiomyopathy, and anterior heart attack, so a big anterior MI can cause it, myocarditis, hyperkalemia, digoxin toxicity, among many others. Okay, so this is always a pathologic finding, okay, and this has adverse cardiovascular outcomes secondary to impairing the left ventricular function. Okay, so just an important one that you want to uh, keep in mind. So again, the mean QRS should be at least 120 milliseconds in adults, and then children based on age. Uh, the late QRS complex forms should have the negative terminal S wave, as we saw here in V1 and often V2 as well. You'll see the broad notched and slurred R waves in those left lateral leads that we discussed, okay? Um, and that's due to that late vector, as we mentioned, going towards those leads. Now there tends to be an absence of Q waves in, v, in lead one, uh, V5, V6, okay? But narrow complexes elsewhere. Okay, so we do not always see these Q waves. Now, it's not uh, impossible, but they're not always there in those leads because most of the force is going away. Okay, so it doesn't always pick that up. Now, there may be a delayed onset in the intrinsicoid deflection from the beginning of the QRS to the peak R wave in the left lateral leads. And what that means is that if there's no Q wave here, so imagine that you have a complex and then something like this, there's a delayed upstroke from the beginning to the top here. We call this the intrinsicoid deflection, and that may be delayed over 60 milliseconds. Okay. The main things I want you to get out of here are recognizing those findings in the precordial leads here, okay, and why they come about. So these here in V1 and V2, and then notice that in V5 and V6. Okay, almost the opposite of what we saw in a right bundle branch block. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Again, this is pathologic and something you want to be aware of. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. 
Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos, and this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book okay and then you also have the pocket guide available so you can choose which format they are the same thing both these uh, book and the pocket guide uh, different formats uh, i really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go now with the book you also get videos so notice these are the videos okay and these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic and it's used now among many institutions so use uh, check that out now what it also includes are calipers so yes you get calipers with this course okay um i don't know anyone else that offers that but you do get calipers i think they're very helpful and they can uh you know if you know how to use them correctly uh can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on okay and then you also get our pocket EKG reference okay this was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows uh, and this is really nice it has every code as you saw earlier laid out there very small pocket guide available I had help with uh, my colleague Dr. Peter Noseworthy who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic and editing it so this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful so go to the ekg course you'll see examples of lectures okay why we developed this okay a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning ekgs having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and you know still struggling so uh, my struggle is a struggle that i don't want you to have in learning them okay you can read all those introductory books but honestly they are not uh, enough okay and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material so uh, we don't really make much off it it's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care that's why we do this and we love doing it so thank you so much for your support um, if you have any questions just leave them below and we're happy to answer them all right have a great day